Hello friends, and welcome back to this second installment of uh, this kind of reflection on Plato's Apology. Again, I'm just going through, I'm reading the dialogue and commenting on it as I go through um, based on my experience with and love for Plato and, uh, and this dialogue. So again, you can click on the link to follow along with the reading in the description. And to get the playlist, you can also click on the link in the description and see. Uh, if you're curious just to have the audiobook without any commentary or reflection, there's a link in the description as well. So we got through the first paragraph last time, and uh, that was basically Socrates just saying, uh, you know, here I am, and I've never been in court before, so please be patient with me. But also this idea of him not knowing. Right away he starts off with that. And then at the end he says basically his job is to speak truly, and for them... Their job is to judge justly. A good general principle. That was the first paragraph. It took us 10 minutes. And this will probably just be the second paragraph. And it begins, And first, I have to reply to the older charges and to my first accusers, and then I will go on to the later ones. Now, right away, this is a little bit confusing because he just said he's never been in court before. He had never had any charges brought against him. It's his first time. He's not used to the way of having to speak, etc. And he says, I have to reply to the older charges. So what older charges could he be talking about? He says, for I have had many accusers, again, surprising, who accused me of old, and their false charges have continued during many years, and I am more afraid of them than of Anidas and his associates who are dangerous to in their own way. But far more dangerous are these who began when you were children. Okay, so now we're starting to get a little bit of a, a hint you got to realize he is now addressing 300 of the landowners in Athens. And he is 70 years old, so he's an old man. Uh, most of these people are younger than him. And so they grew up, as they were children, hearing about Socrates. So he says, that's why these people began when you were children and took possession of your minds with their falsehoods, telling of one Socrates, a wise man, who speculated about the heaven above and searched into the earth beneath and made the worst appear the better cause. What he's saying is that as you were growing up, people were talking about me. There were rumors going around. You know, uh, you could say there was the social media of the day, and uh, you know they were looking at the memes of this guy, this this funny guy Socrates, and people making fun of him. And uh, whatever the people were saying, it went unanswered. Socrates wasn't there to answer it, and so there were all just these catchphrases and slogans about this guy named Socrates, right? That he speculated about all these things and he made the worse appear the better cause. That's an insult, making some, taking something bad and making it look good. Now we just call it advertising. It's a joke, by the way. Uh, but he's saying that, you know, you've heard all this stuff and so what's happened is that there is this prejudice, this bias against me that's been built up after all of these years. And he says, this is even more dangerous than the people who are here in court to um, you know, present their case against me. Uh, he says, these are the accusers whom I dread, for they are the circulators of this rumor, and their hearers are too apt to fancy that speculators of this sort do not believe in the gods. And they are many, and their charges against me are of ancient date, and they made them in days when you were impressible in childhood or perhaps in youth. And the cause when heard went by default, for there was none to answer. And hardest of all their names I do not know and cannot tell, unless in the chance of a comic poet. Um, there was a, a play that was written called The Clouds, and Socrates, you know, appears and he shows up. So he's like, that's the one case where I can identify a person and look at what they said and, and reply to it. Because here's the thing. When we, whenever we hear, um, you know, rumors or people even making jokes about a particular person or even a whole group, it builds up this prejudice and this bias in us. And that's even harder to get past than a clearly stated um, logical proposition that's made. You know, somebody makes a clear statement and you can answer it and you can reply to it with reason. But when it's just this prejudice that's built up in us, this kind of reaction that we have, that's super hard to get past. In philosophy in general, that is one of the biggest problems, is getting over the attachments that we have to the ideas that we've just been raised with. Just like for these people, it's going to be very difficult for them to get over 
the attachments that they have to their ideas about this guy, Socrates. It's very hard for the mind to overcome that, to overcome those assumptions, the things that we've just been raised with and that have been built into us. You know, the things that we have been uh, taught just by the very culture to, to love and to despise. Um, you know, uh, and so if he could look at clearly, like this person said this, and then give a clear, rational response to it, well, that would be one thing, but he can't do that. And the people who have these prejudices and biases built up in them, they themselves probably can't remember exactly the things that were said. And so we have to be really careful that in our quest for truth, right, in our love for truth, this loving pursuit of, of wisdom, um, that we are able to look at the assumptions and the ideas that we just have built into us and to examine them, you know, and to question them. Later on, he says, the unexamined life is not worth living. And that is, that is so true because uh, most of us just live according to these ideas that have been built up in us and go unexamined. <clears throat> he says, uh, but the main body of these slanderers from who from envy and malice have wrought upon you, and there are some of them who are convinced themselves and impart their convictions to others, all these, I say, are most difficult to deal with. For I cannot have them up here and examine them, and therefore I must simply fight with shadows in my own defense and examine uh, when there is no one who answers." That phrase, he says, uh, I, s I simply must fight with shadows. There's another, uh, another translation that says he's boxing with shadows. It's a famous phrase, right? So you can imagine he's trying to fight against these ideas, these impressions that people have. It's like, you know, trying to box with shadows, trying to, to fight something that, you know, it's there one moment, gone the next. You can never really quite land a punch and it evades and moves out of the way. It's like, a, you know, a cat trying to catch a laser pointer can never quite quite get it and that's what Socrates feels like he's up against and that you know keep that in mind too not only in our pursuit pursuit of truth and the ideas that we have in us but also in how we regard people and institutions it's very difficult for us when we're looking at uh, you know a particular person a political figure um, a celebrity Some, sometimes we have these ideas of these celebrities that they're wonderful and they're so wise you know, because of the way that they sing their music, right? And we, we just get this impression of them from, uh, you know, seeing them in movies. And, but they may, they may not actually be that way. They might not actually have a whole lot of wisdom um, just because, uh, you know, they, they sing well or they're good actors. They play the good guys in the movies, right? Um, or they're presented well in, in commercials, in their political commercials, whatever it might be. But to, to actually look at what it is the person says, what kind of wisdom they actually have, um, you know, and look at the, the content and the truth of the things that they say and that they do. And not just how they are presented to us through the media, right, in the way that they would like to be portrayed, perhaps. He says, I will ask you then to assume with me, as I was saying, that my opponents are, are of two kinds, one recent, the other ancient, and I hope that you will see the propriety of my answering the latter first, for these accusations you heard long before of the others, and much oftener. One more uh, kind of uh, metaphor that I think this works for is philosophy itself. Um, you know, I remember growing up and wondering what philosophy was, and philosophy just seemed like this exercise where people come up with all kinds of uh, ideas and possibilities and, oh, well, what if, you know, well, what if my color red is different from your color red? Whoa, that's crazy, you know, mind blown. And, uh, but, but I've, I've learned that that's really not what philosophy is about. You know, the way that philosophy is presented most of the time is as just this abstract um, endeavor where people are coming up with all kinds of crazy ideas where there are no correct answers and we're just imagining all, all sorts of things. <clears throat> and it's really just kind of pointless. Uh, because there really wouldn't be much of a point to that, if that's, if that's all it was. <clears throat> but instead learning to see philosophy kind of through the eyes of Socrates, that it's this loving pursuit of wisdom, 
you could say. I think I've heard that phrase recently, and, uh, and I think it works well. Right. And so we have this kind of built up idea, this prejudice of even what philosophy is. But then to go to it and, and see the master at work, right? The master is, a, you know, Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle. Great place to begin to see, and to see this progression of reading Plato and Aristotle. That it is a love of truth and that it's animated primarily by wonder. Um, I think that if there's no wonder, then it's not really philosophy. It might be something else, some other type of uh, critique or criticism, and I've, I've been around plenty of people who call themselves philosophers where they teach or they're learning philosophy. And really they're just jaded and cynical and they're looking to criticize ideas. They're not actually after this, this love of wisdom and truth. Okay, so that's the second paragraph. That's all we've gotten through so far. But that's okay. I'm, I'm happy to take my time and go slowly through this, uh, this, this dialogue because I think it's worth it. I think it's worth the time. So... Thanks for watching. Thanks for joining me. Don't forget to like and subscribe and check out the links in the description below.